In order to cut these features on the inside, the 1 inch 438, that's the next one in line that I'm going to do. It's got it called out as a 290 flat, and the only way to establish a 290 flat is to know where your cutter is and what size your cutter is. And this is how I'm going to do it. Let's say this is the diameter of the cutter. I'm going to move it in until it bumps the edge of the casting ever so slightly. Maybe put a piece of paper in there until I see it. When it hits, I'm going to move in the radius of the cutter so I know the cutter is on center with the edge. And then it's just a matter of dialing in the required dimension on the print. So when I go to the 290 with the cutter I'm using, there will be a small radius instead of a sharp corner as shown on the part. I will be using a four flute carbide 125 diameter, about a three millimeter cutter. And the features are going to end up out here. That's the back gear shaft. That's when you pull that little lever and the gears change and everything slows down. That's for the inside of that shaft. All right, let's do it. That's a good sign. All right. I like it. Knowing that I just made contact and it's very symmetrical from side to side, that is an absolutely excellent sign. I'm going to move in about two and a half thousandths for the thickness of the paper. And then I'm going to make my 062 offset for the radius and I'm going to go 290 more for the required dimension. As long as the bottom clears the casting, I think we'll be in good shape. 354 and a half is the number. Let's get some gauge blocks and check that out. If that were in a different projection, I could check it with the expandable parallels like I like to. Unfortunately, I don't think I have the room to do that. So, gauge blocks it is. I'll be right back. Any holes that are to be put in through the bores, I am going to do after the bores are in. I do not want to influence the cutter as it passes through here with an interruption. If it hits an interruption, it might go to the low side or the high side, but it could walk. So any holes that you're going to put in for lockdown screws, oil cups, etc., do it after the main bore is already in there. I know it could interrupt the main bore, but float your reamer, emery, whatever, back through it to take care of that for Better chance of a quality hole if it's uninterrupted. All the milling that can be comfortably done in this setup is complete. 
These ears still need a spot face on the outside to bring them down to the specific dimension, but all the milling is complete. So I'm going to take it out, and just because the center line from this boss to the bottom is 750, that doesn't mean that this boss is centrally located in between these jaws. You can still have an asymmetrical triangle, and that would be a that would be a bad thing. So I'm going to stand this thing vertically, align this with the pin, pick up both sides that I'm currently located on, and see exactly what I'm looking at. That'll give me a pretty good idea where the V's are going to end up when I'm done milling this, and exactly how this is all going to line up. All right, let's break the setup down, change it, take a look. Before I cut any grooves in the bottom, and we will cut the grooves before I will do the spindle bore, I need to know how symmetrical that little boss is right there to the rest of the casting. Now, since the center of my universe is going to be that particular boss, I want to make sure that on the x-axis the pin is just spot on center over top of that hole or the protrusion and I know that the center is 750 up so that really doesn't matter at this time. This gives me the opportunity and the access to sweep this part back and forth and find out where the edge of the part is. Both sides. Having done that, I can tell you that it's 560 to one side and it's 540 on the other side. That is quite possibly because the draft was removed from one side or the other. And that would be this side, as a matter of fact, because I located the primary cuts on that flat. That makes perfect sense. Now, the outside surfaces mean absolutely nothing right now. They mean absolutely nothing. But if you're going to cut your grooves in and you want the grooves to be centered with that boss, you need to know these numbers. So when I invert this part, I'm going to make sure that whatever I do, I will bias the center line 20 thousandths off. Simple. I'll flip it over and put some grooves in it. Just a little quickie look at the setup for you. It is an aluminum plate with a channel milled in it exactly the same size as the casting. This is a Delrin rod with a flat on one side. That bites nicely into the casting. The casting is resting on a parallel. It is not going anywhere. It gives me all kinds of access for inspection. For anyone that is unsure of exactly where the center is on this part based on the numbers that I just came up with, this is what I saw from above, 540 on one side and 560 on the other side. Now, yes, there's 20 thousandths extra material on the one side. So, what do you do? Do you pick up the edge and move in 20? And now we have 540 on both sides to center? I suppose that would be an option. But, this is really representative of a 10 thousandths off center for this reason here. Add the two values that you came up with. You get 1 inch 100. Split that in half, that's 550. True center, 550. If you look at these two numbers, if you were to add 10 to this and subtract 10 from that, well, then you would have 550. So realistically, the math works out this way. The pin lined up with the boss on the casting is 10 thousandths off center because if you take 10 away from true center, there it is, 540. Give it back. 10 on the other side, 560. Or actually, when you take the 10 away from this one, this one becomes 560. It just walks over. So as this one grows, this one shrinks. 10 thousandths error. Not bad for a rough casting, and I am quite okay with that, provided the dovetails or the grooves I'm about to cut don't break the edges out. But the chamfer is the working surface, so by all means, have at it. Just make sure you have sufficient projection above the vise when you do this that you don't hit the vise jaws with your chamfer tool. The part is in the machine. The part is inverted, very much like when I put the surface on the back. Now, the reason I didn't cut it when I put that surface on the back is because I didn't know where to cut. Beautiful part of a setup like this is I can sweep the jaws.
I physically wrote on the part where the error was. And the indicator's in the way so you can't see it. So I know basically which side I need to bias. Now I can cut the grooves. But make sure when you return it to this setup, everything's nice and flat. Well, if the planet's lined up when I got out of bed this morning, everything is set and ready to cut. I am looking for a pair of 70 deep grooves, calculated 70 deep. Now, because of the flat on the tip of the tool, it may not actually be 70 deep. But by using a pin and a gauge block, I can figure out what needs to happen. So we're going to cut a first track across that. We're going to set it to some arbitrary number. Have at it. Let's do it. All right, let's lay a pin in there, put a gauge block on it, track the top, see what we get. It may be kind of hard to capture this. Oh, no, it won't. Anybody with good eyes can see the difference in the outside land between the front and the rear. That is the 10th hour offset that I put. This is a 50 thousandths gauge block that is 1.25 millimeters thick. That is my zero surface. That is my gauge surface. When I roll the indicator back across the pin that I dropped in the groove, I need the pin to be a half a thousandths either way of the surface of that block. And I think it's going to be considerably higher at this point because that's the plan. Let's see what happens. Looks like about nine to go. Less than a quarter of a millimeter more. Nine to go.
Okay, I'm going to drag the indicator back off the part, and I'm going to look for the needle to be about a half a thousandth low. Half a thousandth low would be ideal. Ideal. You know, I just don't think it's worth messing with. That is five ten thousandths of an inch difference, and I'm just not going to mess with it. I say leave it right where it is. While it is in this position and you have all the center locations picked up, it is time to put the mounting holes in the bottom. These are 172 tapped. And I'm going to start off by spot facing them with an 075 end mill. That is just under two millimeters in diameter. Four locations. Gonna go five millimeters, two hundred. I may be sorry, but oh well. Let's see what happens. Two hundred from the bottom surface. To change out put a tap follower in here spring loaded neural tap guide actually and i'm going to tap a 172 i'm going to tap it all the way to the bottom all the milling is complete from the first operation all the holes are drilled the part is ready to stand up now here's a shop gem for you to take away from this particular video if you are going to make a feature on a part that is referenced from another feature on that part try to drive from that feature now, as far as this is concerned, the dimensioning scheme on this is given from the bottom, the very bottom flat, not from the dovetail, only because it's probably just a little difficult for most people to, to track, check, whatever. So the thought here is to locate this part, driven by the location of this part, registering on the dovetails. We're going to do that with this fixture right here. This is a little mock-up of the ways. I'm going to load this in the machine using the tailstock as my center of the universe, resting on those V's. As soon as I have this pin indicated, I will swap over to this guy right here, drop him on the exact same fixture, and drill the holes. Now the one thing you do have to keep in mind is if you're looking for a triangle that's going to line up, well you better orient these pieces as such. When this sits in the machine, it sits in the machine this way. So if I'm going to indicate the part from this side, I better load the part and drill it from this side. Although every fiber of my existence is telling me to do it from that side, if there's any asymmetry, it's going to show up and just totally bone this part, so I don't want to do that. A couple minutes invested in the tool. Let's load these pieces back in the machine and get the end bores done. Before we get into the actual drilling of the headstock component, I want to illustrate something that's going to probably help you out. We have to be really careful on how the head is positioned in the fixture. You know, naturally, if you think you're working off the V's and you're going to try to hit that hole, that's, well, you're probably going to hit it. But orientation is critical and this is going to show you exactly why here's the v's that we're locating from here's the hole in the tailstock 
Once you've indicated the hole in the tailstock, you want the headstock to be drilled accordingly so that when they're installed, they line up. If you were to have the headstock on in the incorrect orientation, this way, and there is any error in the symmetry of the bottom to the top, that's what you'll get. So orientation is relatively critical. Okay, Make sure that you drill it in line with the way it's going to be assembled on the model. Taking a quick look at the setup. We're going to set the XY0 on the digital locating from the tailstock. Tram the pin to be sure. Tram it vertically as well. The fixture is modular. The fixture is banked off of one side so I can pull the fixture in and out and recover this particular position right there as soon as I get the headstock on. Sitting on one, two, three blocks, I got some helper blocks to press the fixture against the solid jaw, against the stationary jaw. And when I put the headstock back on here, I'm going to use a bridge clamp that goes across the center, which is good for hold downs and not necessarily for drill guides because you never know if the hole's going to be straight. So use it for hold down and that's it. Make a little bit more sense when I throw it in there. Let's throw the real deal in there. Put a hole in it. A close-up look at the fixture and this was by design the block is going to be a drill guide as well so when I come down through the top I'm going to drill through the clamp the clamp is going to act as a drill guide for the lower holes and reduce the chance of it walking around that is the plan right from the get-go we are sitting on the notches the way the tail stock was positioned we're actually drilling it from the gear cluster side back. This is the back gear lug. So this is the gap between the casting and the face of the tailstock right here. So we are in line the same way the tailstock was. I'm hoping this works. Let's find out. The challenge here is to get the 188 reamed hole for the spindle and the back gear shaft in line in the exact same location as the tailstock. This is the setup. The digital readout is on zero according to the tailstock and at this point I am going to drill and ream a 188 hole. The camera's going to be positioned behind the machine so we're going to be looking at this from a little bit different angle when this process starts. Everything is nice and tight. Fingers crossed, let's do it. Next step, drill and tap for one of the gear clusters on the end. Then we're going to get back over here and put a spot face on this to a very specific dimension. Flip the part and repeat that spot face on the other side. And if any of you guys from PM Research are watching this video, this particular hole does not have a depth call out on the print, guys. So we want to take a look at that. There's plenty of meat in this casting right here to drill this as deep as you want. I'm going to go about 400 deep with this hole, which is <laughs> way beyond what a 172 should have. But I just want to go deeper. So let's do it.
Okay, the beauty of this setup is that I can take that completely out of this machine right now, inspect it, put it right back in, and be on location. There is a secondary hole in this casting that has a little note that says C Note 2, and Note 2 is Locate at Assembly. Now, i got to tell you, I am not a fan of the whole Locate at Assembly thing, so I'm going to try to figure out exactly where that hole is supposed to be. But in the meantime, I will flip it over and put this spot face on the other side. Here is the fruits of our labors. Everything looks pretty good. I'm very pleased. Now, as far as this little spot face on the end is concerned, there's one of these nasty little things that has to be fit in there, and that particular slot right there will be some type of change mechanism for God knows what. But that's where they say locate at assembly, probably because they don't even know where the hole's supposed to be. So I'll figure it out, and we'll put it there. This is the back gear shaft back here, and this will be the spindle that will actually go through the pulleys. Now, I know you want to see it, so let's do it, right? Let's put the headstock on there. Protrude that pin a little bit. And drum roll, please. With any kind of luck, and this is the whole idea. This tailstock has got to go straight on there, hopefully without changing the location of this pin. Pull that out a little bit just to see. So one thousandth undersized pin. Let me zoom in for that. There we go. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Gotta love it. Now, it's all about the tooling, guys. It is definitely about the fixtures. Working surfaces on this model are these Vs, and if you use any other surface, you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt, so don't do it. But that is about all I can stand. That's about all the fun I can have for one day. It is a beautiful day here in Texas, and finally stopped raining after God knows how long. And my lawn is about a foot tall, so I'm going to bug out and go cut some grass, drink some cold beer, and upload this movie. I hope you enjoyed watching that. Thank you very much for hanging in. Hit that subscribe button. Show me that you uh, appreciate the effort it takes to do this because it is not easy to cut and film all at the same time. But there you go. That is looking sharp. I am loving it. The alignment is just beautiful. Can't even feel it go in that hole. That's a good thing for this model. There you go. Thank you once again, Joel Pye Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. I hope you're well wherever you are. I'm out.